The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus heard of the death of John the Baptist, he withdrew in a boat to a deserted place by himself. The crowds heard of this and followed him on foot from their towns. When he disembarked and saw the vast crowd, his heart was moved with pity for them, and he cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples approached him and said, This is a deserted place, and it is already late. Dismiss the crowds so that they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, There is no need for them to go away. Give them some food yourselves. But they said to him, Five loaves and two fish are all we have here. Then he said, Bring them here to me. And he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he said the blessing, broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples, who in turn gave them to the crowds. They all ate and were satisfied and they picked up the fragments left over, 12 wicker baskets full. Those who ate were about 5,000 men, not counting women and children. The Gospel of the Lord. This dramatic and pivotal miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 presents us with two realities that we can confidently call today good news. The first is that Jesus indeed has the power to save us. And second, that this great power comes to us each and every time we share in this Eucharistic feast. But it is always nourishing for us to renew this connection in our mind and heart between this moment when Jesus feeds the people with bread and the many moments, week in and week out, in which he feeds us with the bread of eternal life. This story and the accompanying scriptures that we hear today present us with four movements to Jesus' great act of compassion upon the people that offer food for our reflection today. The experience of spiritual hunger, eating well, being satisfied, and being nourished for our discipleship. In the spiritual life, this hunger can take many forms. It can be a desire for mercy because we have sinned, a desire for grace and strength because we are weak, a desire to be closer to our God, a desire for community and fellowship in Christ, it can also be a hunger that some of you might have felt more intensely as you have been deprived of the Eucharist over these past months. On the other hand, this is not a hunger that is immediately obvious to us. At least we don't feel it as we feel that hunger, as the afternoon is getting on and we're tired, and we start thinking about what we're going to have for dinner. If we don't eat, that physical hunger will come no matter what, and we can't help but be conscious of it, since our body makes it so known to us. Our hunger for the Eucharist is different and less obvious. It's not as easily perceptible. Human beings have many strategies and options when addressing our spiritual hunger. Some of these alternatives are supposed to keep us from feeling the guilt that God's mer for which God's mercy is a remedy, or keeps us from feeling the consequences of our sinful actions, or to satisfy our longing for deep and meaningful human connection. We have many foods that we use to try to end our spiritual hunger, which, though more subtle, this hunger can be gnawing at our souls just as persistently as the hunger that gnaws at our stomachs. After all, who told you that you were first hungry? 
When you cried out as an infant or a child because of the discomfort of your hunger, your parents gave you food, and you stopped crying. We're all human beings, and we're equipped with intelligence and reason. We put two and two together, and we realize what hunger is and what we need to do to fix it. It's the same with our spiritual hunger. The scriptures, the church, our spiritual models and mentors, when we're hurting and starving for Jesus, they point out to us that Jesus is what we need. Surely there have been moments in your life when you have filled that void with Jesus and then felt at peace. It's time to put two and two together. Use your intelligence and your reason so that whatever the nature of the spiritual hunger you feel, you have the knowledge that the bread of angels will satisfy it. So will simply taking the Eucharist at communion time be enough? What does it mean when the prophet Isaiah conveys God's word to us? Heed me, and you shall eat well. A tiny little wafer of bread doesn't really seem as if it demonstrates the fullness of what it actually is, namely the body of Christ. At a meal, it isn't just the food we eat, nor the volume of it that we eat. It's the ritual that goes around a good meal. There's the conversation, the fellowship and friendship, storytelling, sharing concerns about loved ones and the world, seeking forgiveness and reconciliation. The good community that occurs around a good meal is essential. And while the Eucharist that we receive certainly contains the fullness of the grace of Christ's passion, death, and resurrection, the rest of our time together at Mass is what helps us to eat well. You can eat the same amount in 10 minutes while you're on the run than you can over a two-hour meal, but the former experience sure feels different than the latter. We need everything that comes along with the Eucharist that we receive. We hunger for the entire experience. And in heeding the Lord's command to come to his table, he allows us to eat well and be satisfied. So what does being satisfied mean? It doesn't mean simply being full. It means that all of our needs are met. The hand of the Lord feeds us. He answers all our needs. Notice that the psalmist doesn't say that he answers all of our wants. At this great Eucharistic feast, God gives us all that we need in order to love him and to serve him. Often, we don't know what we really need. We think we do, but we can be mistaken, especially if, we're, if we've lost sight of what's important. We have to allow God to prepare the feast for us, and we have to trust that he will provide us with something beautiful that will satisfy. No special ordering here. God, who knows us better than we know ourselves, will provide. But this doesn't excuse us. It doesn't mean we put ourselves on autopilot, expecting God just to do everything for us. This is the mistake that the people make in John's version of this great miracle. The people start following Jesus around because he's able to fill their stomachs, and not because he's able to give them the bread of life. We cannot equate being satisfied to having all of our problems solved. And yet this meal will be more satisfying if we do undertake a bit of self-examination in prayer and look for the places in our hearts and in our lives where we need transformation, conversion, and the gift of God's grace. One thing is for certain, our regular participation at this Eucharist builds upon and solidifies our baptism. St. Paul asked the question, what will separate us from the love of Christ? The Eucharist assures that we will remain in him and he in us, that we will never be separated from his love. It solidifies our participation in the body of Christ that then prepares us to be Christ in the world. Having eaten well, having been satisfied, it's now time to go out 
that now that we're nourished for our renewed discipleship. There are many challenges in this world, both spiritual and material. And this world in need, often like us, doesn't know that it needs Jesus. So many consume what fails to satisfy. And in our service to them, we can feed them, yes, but we can also be living signs of God's love, showing them where they can be fed and truly satisfied. There's great resistance to this, especially since the evil one's deceptions about what constitutes good food can be so strong. My brothers and sisters, what we offer here around this table is indeed a miraculous food, one that does not fill our physical stomachs. What we offer requires faith, or at least it requires us to put our foot on the path of faith. This is, after all, why Jesus performed this miracle. As with so many of his wondrous deeds, the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves stands as proof that his promise of eternal life will be fulfilled. Similarly, our discipleship rooted in Christ and in his love for all humanity will show the world that his promises are real. For in our hunger and in our weakness, our ability to love like him can only have its source in Jesus, who won for us the gift of eternal life.